Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If we could ask you to take your seats, that would be wonderful. Thank you. The magic screen is going off. <laughs> On cue, I might add. Well, welcome to tonight's Lesson in Legends uh, for the real estate program. My name is Darlene Smith, and I'm the very proud Dean of the Merrick School of Business here at the University of Baltimore. Before we get into tonight's program, I would like everyone to pull out their phone and make sure that it is turned off or on vibrate. Um, as much as we try to remember these things, seldom, it, it, once in a while it doesn't occur. For those of you who are tweeting tonight's event, the hashtag is St. John 2013, okay? St. John 2013. Um, tonight is a celebration of the dynamic real estate market and industry in Baltimore and beyond. And because of the strength of the real estate industry, the University of Baltimore Merrick School of Business started the Real Estate and Economic Development Program headed by Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford, if you could just stand up for a moment. Dr. Ford, who is chair of our department. <laughs> And it is the only undergraduate program, real estate program here in Maryland. It was actually launched in 2007 by, um, in all honesty, the, the passion of Dr. Ford um, in serving this industry. And it has been her um, commitment and devotion to this program that has made it the success that it is today. We have over 60 students in the program. Uh, we have graduated. Uh, about half that um, amount so far in a, in the relatively short amount of time. So we're proud of that program because it teaches the unique aspects um, about the real estate industry and it also brings awareness to career opportunities in real estate in both the public and private sectors. Uh, my counterpart here tonight um, is Daniel Thomas, our um, chair of our very strong real estate advisory board. And when we talk about having programs that are relevant to the needs of the community, we are very fortunate to have a very active advisory board made up of real estate professionals. And they meet with our faculty um, on an ongoing basis several times a year to make sure that um, our programs, our courses, our mentoring, our co-curricular activities, our value-added opportunities for our students, and providing a very important link between what we do in the classroom and the needs of employers um, in the real estate community. And Daniel has been a distinguished leader, um, has been um, working with us, sometimes day and night, and we won't tell Ed how much he's been working with us. Um, but it's that leadership that has been absolutely crucial to the success of the program. So I'm gonna turn this Thank over you. to Daniel. Thank you, Dean Smith. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you at the University of Baltimore and also with uh, so many friends and students. Um, along with wearing the hat of being the, the chair of the Real Estate and Economic Development Advisory Board, I also wear another uh, hat that I cherish, and that's being a, uh, a partner in training uh, under our legend here tonight at St. John Properties. Uh, Lessons from Legends, it's a, uh, it's a little bit different than a lot of other events that you might go to. Uh, Lessons from Legends, it's still in its infancy, but it's, it's growing very rapidly from an idea that the very best way to learn is directly from the legends of our industry. Uh, you may see the cameras down in front here. Uh, the University of Baltimore is not only uh, recording, but we're archiving the, uh, the lessons, uh, the successes, the challenges, the triumphs, the failures of our industry's legends. Uh, last fall, we had uh, the opportunity to listen to and learn from Tom Bizzuto. And tonight's going to be very special also because we get the opportunity to sit at the feet of one of our industry's greatest legends. And Lessons from Legends, it's a student-oriented event. 
but it's been greatly supported by the industry, and we're very appreciative of that. Great. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors for tonight, um, our annual sponsors for our real estate program, our Green Newit, Horde Copland Mocked, ISG, the Maryland Center for Construction, Education, and Innovation, and PNC Bank. Um, the event sponsors for tonight are Continental Title Group, Morris and Ritchie Associates, and Open Range Video Productions. It's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, our moderator for tonight. And he is not only an alum, of the University of Baltimore and the current president of St. John Properties, but he's also a personal mentor, icon, role model, inspiration, and friend. Even as the president of a $2 billion enterprise, you'll often find him in the office kitchen getting coffee for somebody who works under him. He is a great boss and man. He has been with St. John Properties for over 31 years. I was two years old. <laughs> Prior to his appointment as, uh, as president of St. John Properties, back in March of 2011, he held the position of senior vice president and chief financial officer. As president, he oversees the day-to-day -day functions of St. John Properties with specific responsibilities, including all phases of development, asset management, marketing, leasing, and financial operations. He earned a bachelor of science degree in accounting from the University of Baltimore in 1980 and an MBA from the University of Baltimore in 1988. <laughs> he is a certified public accountant and a collector of 15 prehistoric HP 17B2 calculators. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> With orange buttons, not green. <laughs> We're pleased to have tonight as our moderator, and we'll welcome him to the stage, Larry Maycrantz. By the Thank way, you. I was two years old also. <laughs> <laughs> I was minus five. <laughs> Before introducing tonight's legend, I would actually like to go off script for a moment and share with you a story. I'll try to make it a quick one. Um, about when I first got into an extended conversation um, about Ed St. John. Ed wasn't around. It was actually in Argentina. And Ed's probably going, Argentina. And um, I had the, the honor of, uh, of uh, one of my MBA students. His name was Rob Merritt of Merritt Properties. And what I do every year with our students is go on an international field study. And so Rob was my student, and he came up to me, and he said, I have a favor to ask. I said, OK. He said, would it be OK if my father came along on the trip. Well, no one has ever asked that their parent come along. So I said, well, tell me a little bit about your father. And um, what I heard, I couldn't possibly say no. And so um, Leroy came on the trip. And for any of those of you in the audience who know Leroy Merritt, you can imagine what a wonderful addition he was to the learning experience uh, in many, many ways. And uh, so one night, after dinner, sitting around is having drinks. Um, we start, I asked Leroy to tell me his real story. And I said, I know where you are today. Um, how did you get here? And by this point in time, five or six students had come around. And about two and a half hours later, um, uh, the story ended. And there was lots of questions. Um, but a great deal of that story focused on Leroy and Ed. And, and there were lots of questions about that initial partnership. And there was laughter. And when Leroy had finally finished and put his last drink down, and I turned to my students, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, we've traveled thousands of miles. And what you've just heard is one legend and his story talking about another legend who we haven't had a chance to meet. And so it's kind of fortuitous that 10 years later, 
and God rest um, Leroy's soul, uh, that Ed is here um, as a legend, talking to a much larger group, um, and in what I will surely be an, an equally inspirational um, story. And so it just goes to show how close Baltimore can be at times. And um, I still remember that two and a half hours that night with Leroy as though it was last week. So, so let's get to um, uh, talking a little bit about my introduction to Ed St. John. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Maryland College Park in 1961. In May of 2012, Ed was bestowed an honorary doctor of public service from his alma mater. St. John Properties, the company he founded 42 years ago, now owns and manages over 17 million square feet of real estate. It is valued at more than two billion and services over 1,700 tenants in seven states. So when I look out this audience and see all of the students, students here, this is a phenomenal opportunity to listen and to ask questions from truly a legend. He has impacted the state economically through his successful company, as a leader through his public service, and I'm also talking to the students equally as important through his leadership in the community and his philanthropic support of, of a lot of important charities. And we talk a lot in our classrooms about the real um, meaning of leadership, of leadership in one's company, leadership in one organization, leadership in one's family. Uh, and Ed personifies what we talk about in terms of the ideals of leadership. So please join me in welcoming tonight's legend, Ed St. John. <laughs> Good evening, Ed. Good evening. <laughs> How did you get us these great seats? <laughs> now, first of all, I'd like to thank Ed for coming tonight and sharing his personal and professional experiences with all of us. I've had the pleasure of working for Ed for 31 years, and I've learned a lot from him. And I'm sure everyone here is just excited about the opportunity to be able to sit here and listen to your, your life story. So thank you very much. If you're ready, we'll start with some questions. We'll start early on. So as a child, Ed, where did you grow up and what did your parents do for a living? Uh, I grew up in uh, Pimlico. And uh, uh, what did my father do for a living? He did a lot of things. Uh, he got a, as you heard tonight, he got a degree, from, a CPA degree from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, which when I found out what the Wharton School in the University of Pennsylvania was later in life, I went to him and said, wow, you went to an Ivy League school. He said, it was no big deal, it was the school in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that was a school in his neighborhood. Uh, he then went into accounting, as you would probably assume. Then he went into banking. Uh, and after that, he went into home building. And I'm trying to remember the order. Uh, then he went into uh, a fascinating thing was car carriers that carried automobiles. So he started manufacturing car carriers and carried automobiles and he sold that to a, the Anchor Motor Freight and it's the Baltimore division of Anchor Motor Freight now. Then he took that experience <clears throat> and started building. He was the first one to put tractor trailers, the trailers used to have canvas tops. And he was the first one to put an aluminum top on instead of canvas. And he sold that to the Fruhoff Trailer Company. Then the war broke out and he became a superintendent uh, building Liberty ships. And he had 4,000 men working for him. And he made the equivalent of something like $750,000 a year. Run, running the 4,000 men. Because I wondered why he went from business to that. And he said, for money, why? why for money? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
Then, then he died when I was 16. At that time, he had three companies. He had a manufacturing company that manufactured building materials, and he had a distribution company that distributed building materials, and he had built five 10,000 square foot commercial buildings, industrial buildings. So that's what it was. Sounds like a true entrepreneur. He was. I think if you look him up in Webster's, that's, you can see his picture. So growing up in the St. John family, what was the most valuable lesson you learned? If you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was taught. By the way, Ed, were you ever in the back? Did you ever work for someone? When I was 17, I worked for a year. Didn't like that, right? I didn't like that. <laughs> so after high school, what was your career goal? My career goal was to be a fighter pilot and test pilot for the United States Air Force. So how did that lead to you signing up for an engineering degree at the University of Maryland? I went down there and it was, you used to go to the armory, it was called the old armory. And I walked up to the Air Force ROTC <coughs> desk and I said, what degree do I need for, to be a test pilot? And a, well, not a fighter pilot, but a test pilot. And this guy brought out this book about that thick. And he looked it up and he said, the number one degree is electrical engineering. I said, thank you. I went and signed up for electrical engineering. Hmm. By the way, Ed, I don't know if you remember, I've always heard how difficult engineering is. But when I was interviewing with you in 1982, Ed said, well, how are your grades? And I said, well, I'm very proud of them, Ed. And of course, you can check them out, Dean Smith. I had a 3.65 grade point average. So I'm, I'm not lying. And then you looked at me. And do you remember what you told me your goal was with your grade point average at the University of Maryland? With three point? My goal? Yes. Yeah, the, you, the requirement was a 3.0 you needed to graduate. No, so we needed a 2.0. 2.0. <laughs> so, and I got a 2.01. 2.01. <laughs> but I had one help. <laughs> that humbled me right away when I was interviewing, <laughs> trust me. So looking back over the years, how did that education help you in business? I think an engineering degree, and I do mean this to the students that are sitting here, and I'm not taking anything away from all of the degrees, but engineering teaches applied math. And I've told many, many students, if you don't know what you want to be, take math. If you want a better degree, take engineering, because it teaches you to apply math. It teaches you to think clearly. It teaches you to, to take the givens and come up with a result. And I don't know any other degree other than math or engineering that does that. And I just applied all those principles that I was taught to business. Thank you for supporting math. Oh, great. <laughs> math is it, I'm telling you. Very important. Here's what's given. And here's, here's what you want to get to. Black box. I've heard that from you so many times. Yeah. What goes in and you evaluate what comes out. That's right. So, so now you're in the engineering program at the University of Maryland. How did you ever end up in real estate? Well, remember, <clears throat> the only reason I was in engineering was to fly airplanes and to be a test pilot. Uh, and that's what I was doing. I, was, I had taken basic flight training. I had uh, two or three hours in, in jet trainers. Uh, and my mother comes to me, and I'll never forget her words. She said, if you don't stop this flight, this flying foolishness, I'm going to sell the companies. Well, you got to remember, I was like 21 years old. So I went to the smartest people I know, my fraternity brothers. <laughs> <laughs> And we went to the town hall, which is still there, and over a six-pack of beer, we decided that anybody can be a pilot, but to be in business in 1961 was the goal. So I dropped out of the flight program, and I went into business. And the three businesses, as I previously said, was manufacturing of building materials, distribution of building materials, like medicine cabinets and kitchen cabinets and stoves, and uh, 
five buildings, five 10,000 square foot buildings that my father had built. And I soon realized that manufacturing, even though some people, my father loved it, I found it boring. Right? Just, you built something on Monday and you got it sold by Friday and if you did it right, you had the privilege to build it all over again on Monday. And it, I did it. <laughs> the distribution business, you kept about a half a percent of, of your gross profit. I mean, you, of, that's all, I mean, it was a very thin business. But I loved going and talking to the tenants, fixing the roofs, working out the mechanical problems. I just loved it. But I didn't know how to build. You know, I was an electrical engineer. I could fix your TV set, but I didn't know how to build. <laughs> so because of my connections from the distribution business, I went to look for the most honest builder around. And it turned out to be Leroy Merrick. I mean, everybody recommended him as being straightforward, honest. Then I found out that he owned a block laying company, and commercial buildings are made out of block. So it worked out great. Mm. So that's well, how it thank God it was only a six pack of beer, because if it had been a 12 pack, you'd probably be in <laughs> manufacturing or distribution, and I wouldn't be here with you today. So, <laughs> so uh, today you build many beautiful buildings. And I see the excitement in your eye every time an architect shows us a picture of one of the buildings we're working on. And I look back to 1967 and I tried to envision how you felt when you built your first building, Stafford Avenue. Can you tell us what did Stafford Avenue look like? To me? Yes. It was the most beautiful building in the world. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> it was absolutely the most beautiful building in the world because I had been there and helped build it from scratch with just a piece of dirt. We built it. And if I take you there today, it's six garages, <laughs> little teeny garages. But, and we still own it. We will own it, I guess, go I'm gone. But then you can sell it. Never sell it. <laughs> no, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so by the way, was it painted block? Or? Painted block building. Uh -huh. So. You and Leroy are very successful. You're together from 1967 to 1971. You build 500,000 square feet of buildings. Mm -hmm. What happened in 1971 to change that? Leroy and I were great friends. We were great friends till the day he died. In fact, I was skiing in uh, Aspen, and I talked to his wife, and his wife said, Ed, you don't have to bother coming back. Le Leroy is going to live another couple of months because he had cancer. I mean, not cancer, he had mesothelioma, even though he could never remember being exposed to asbestos. And I guess that's lung cancer caused by asbestos. Anyway, I got a call from Scott Dorsey, his nephew. And Scott said, Leroy's not going to live the next 24 hours. If you want to see him, you've got to get here. So I got on a plane and flew back immediately. And I was with him hours before he died. Uh, but Leroy was one of the most generous, big-hearted human beings I've ever met in my life. And it reflected in business. Leroy would rather hire two C people and give two C people a job and feel good about it. Whereas I've always been hire A+. Plus. And you get more out of A-plus people than you get out of 2C people. And it costs about the same. And that was starting to get in our way. Uh, we, we started to have a lot of employees, many of which didn't do anything. And it just bugged the H out of me. And then one day, Leroy and I decided, that's it. <laughs> you go hire A people, and he'll keep hiring C people. Right. So dividing a company, so you and Leroy want to break up now, and dividing a company can be a very complex process. What was your approach? Well, it wasn't my approach. It was Leroy's attorney's approach was that Leroy hire an appraiser, and I hire an appraiser, and the two appraisers hire an appraiser, <laughs> and the three appraisers break up the company. My attorney, Joe Margolis, who was much lesser stature than Leroy's attorney. Leroy had a very, very 
my stature too, uh, said, that's kind of silly. Why don't you flip a coin? Whoever wins the flip can either make two piles or designate the other person to make two piles. And you know they're going to be equal because the other guy's going to pick. I said, well, we were and I said, that makes sense. So we flipped a coin. He won the flip. And he said, you make the piles. So I made two piles. And I said, well, Leroy, what are you looking for? And he says, cash. I love cash. <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking for future growth. So I took all the older projects we had. Well, none of them were older than five years, but they were the ones we had built in the first two years. They had thrown up a lot of cash. So I put that in one pile, and I put cash in the pile. And then I put in the other pile of about equal value uh, all the newest projects, the ones that we built in Towson. You know, right on 83 and right on York Road. Mm -hmm. Because I knew in the future, in my opinion, they were going to be worth more money than the other pile. But it's going to take 10, 20 years. And uh, of course, Lee, where you look at the two piles and picked the one with all the cash. That's how we took away the company. And all it cost was re-recording the deeds. That was it. Mm. It was nothing else. So in 1971, you started your own company, Maryland Industrial Enterprises. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like in the early years? It was so much easier than it is today. I am telling you, it was so much easier. Uh, I hired the accountant, Gertrude Kessler, who uh, had worked for me years before in one of those other businesses. Uh, and then I went and hired, you know, put an ad in the paper and hired a uh, construction manager, uh, Cal Calvin, Calvin Jenkins. Jenkins. And then uh, one of the guys I went to college with came in as, uh, as, as an assistant, John Prisbella, and then we hired a receptionist. And uh, at first we started in Phil Ratcliffe's office. He let us have some space there, and then we moved over to Village Across Keys, uh, and we started building buildings. We started building warehouses. That's what happened. Oh, and all you had to do was build a building, and a bank would lend you the money to build the building, and then you, if you got a permanent commitment. So you went to an insurance company, got a permanent commitment from an insurance company, and with that permanent commitment, the bank would lend you money. And then once you got it built, then you got 80% of the money from the insurance company. It was a process that was so smooth. Today, it's brain damage. It is absolute brain damage. Thank God it was then. That's all I can say. By the way, when I started with Ed in 1982, he drove a pickup truck, he wore construction boots, and he physically worked at every project during the day. Then when we would have to meet with a bank, he would come into the office, put on loafers, a tie, navy blue jacket, and we'd go off and meet with the bank. That's right. So he was truly hands-on from the you know, boots on the ground. So it was really exciting to watch that mm -hmm. and to watch the transition to the person that he is today. So. So from 1971 to 1982, Ed, you built 2 million square feet of bulk warehouses. That's right. Then in 1982, you created a brand new product type. Can you tell us the new, what the new product type was and why you did it? Okay. We had done a, we were doing, in the process of doing a project that's called BWI now. At the time it was called Friendship Business Center. And the first building was our typical block building, and I think it had some little metal trim at the top. And it was a smaller building. It wasn't a, uh, the, the, the buildings we built, if they had a railroad siding behind them, they were 200 feet deep. And if they didn't, they were 100 feet deep. And this one was probably 40, 400 feet long and 100 feet deep, about 40,000 square feet. And the asphalt parking lot went right up to the front door. No shrubbery, you know, very economical. That's a fancy word for cheap. <laughs> uh, so, and then I rented it to this guy, and this guy I rented it to, one day came out and he says, you know, I spend more time here than I spend at home. And I'm thinking, all right, what's he getting at? He said, why can't you build a building that's as, you know, as good looking as my house? 
and have parking out front and trucks out back instead of trucks out front. Thought, well, why can't I? I don't know. I'll try it. So the building right behind it, if you go down there right now today, you will find the one building has the asphalt right up front and the loading and the drive-in doors in the front. And you, the building right behind it, at, at, it's now called BWI, Business Center, has some lawn out front, it has bushes out front, it has car parking out front, and all the trucks are in the back. That building rented faster than any building we had ever built. So I thought, wow, we discovered something here. So from then on, all our, we became known as the flex building build, builders. And the flex building is very simply a brick building that looks like offices on the front. It looks just like an office, one story office building. But you go around the back, and there's dock doors and drive in doors in the back. So that's how it started. Actually, its nickname was the King of Flex. And then um, actually, I heard some brokers joke before we started building multi story office buildings. And they said that Ed's version of a multi-story office building was stacking three flex buildings on top of each other. <laughs> this area is, I, I think, been the key to your success. Many of our most successful projects that we have done have had significant development issues in the very beginning. Right. Um, BWI Commerce Park, you had to remove and move one million yards of sand. Lakeshore Plaza Shopping Center had a 13-acre hole, which it filled with the sand from BWI. <laughs> um, we've cleaned three junkyard sites. We had one rock quarry that had 75 feet of loose fill that it went out there and used dynamic compaction to, to fix. We, and, and by the way, people would not buy these parcels of land because of the problems. And Ed would think outside the box and therefore be able to go and think of ways to make the land useful. Uh, what the final example would be we have a Windsor Mill project that has had rock issues. So Ed, the question is, and by the way, we've had many other issues. Almost every project starts off with difficult development issues. And again, it's the key to our success to be able to overcome them. But Ed, in your experience, in 45 years, which project has had the most significant development issues, and how did you solve them? Well, it was the Windsor Mill project. It was 85 acres, and it had more rock than anything I'd ever run into in my life. And in fact, the bank had taken it back, and they had some crazy price tag. In my, my, my opinion, it was crazy because of the rock. And they decided to be developers, so they went out and hired a four-feed developer, and I think it was a post office. They sold a lot to a post office, and they went to put the post office in, and they ran into rock. <laughs> Nobody ever did any test borings. So they run into rock, and the project ran over something like $3 million, so they lost $3 million on the project. So they decided immediately, we're not going to be developers. Two more developers came in, took the thing under contract at the price they wanted, and uh, ran into rock and ran away. Uh, finally, they called me up at the price I offered, which was $38,000 an acre, and said, if you want it, you can have it. We're sick of it. And uh, I said, well, I need 60 days to figure out where this rock is. And they said, OK, you have 60 days. But we want to settle by the end of the year. What I did is I laid out the whole project, the whole 85 acres, with flex buildings. I actually laid it out completely uh, with the idea of keeping it as high as we could with the dirt that we had. And then we couldn't afford test borings, because test borings, are, you, you bore about a three inch tube and you test all the soil, because mainly there to test the soil. All I wanted to know was where the rock was. So we figured out if we took a dynamite machine, a machine that bores the holes where you stick the dynamite down, all we wanted to know is when that dynamite boring machine hit the rock, where was the rock? And we just went around where we had laid out all these buildings, had a surveyor lay out all the buildings, and lay out all the pipes and all the ponds that we needed. We knew within 60 days exactly what it was going to cost us to blast that rock. That's how we did it. Amazing. 
By the way, um, just a little side note. Do you remember the day you called all the senior vice presidents into the front conference room to decide on this project? Can you <laughs> fill us in? I, I knew it would bring a smile to his face. Yeah, we, we, yeah I called them all in and I, you know, I said, uh, and we had a project right down the street that was very, had, had been unsuccessful. I mean, it was poor leasing and everything else. But this site, was near Security Square Mall, right near the million square foot Hickfoot. Hickfoot, Hickfoot. whatever that's health and resources and Social or Security. And right near Social Security. And between two Beltway intersections, and it's visible from the Beltway. As far as I was concerned, it was a triple A location. But because of the failure of that other site that was right down the street from this, I had six people vote, let's not do it. But I have seven votes. <laughs> he didn't tell us about the seven until after we all voted. We figured it was a done deal. That's but the, it's been one of our most successful projects. Yeah, it is. So, Ed, in your 45-year career in real estate, you've been through many business cycles. So some of the down cycles 1975, the oil crisis. 1981, prime interest rate got up to 22%. 1991, we had the collapse of commercial real estate and the commercial banks. 2001, we had the dot-com bubble. See the uh, similarities? Everything's 01. And then most recently, 2008, we had the Great Recession, which we're still feeling the effects of. So in your opinion, which downturn was the most difficult and why? I politically can't tell you what. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's what we're going through right now. In the 91-95 recession, which is when the banks collapsed, commercial real estate collapsed and they took down some banks with it. Uh, up till then, that had been the worst recession since the Great Depression. And the, the war cry was survive till 95. Well, we survived. Uh, but and we, uh, our, our occupancy went from 95%, which our normal occupancy was around 95, down to 89, and we, were, uh, we thought we were ready to jump out off, the, off a bridge or something. Today we're at 85, and it really, really is affecting us. And it's, it's just the tough regulations that we have now, people thinking that the pr proper thing to do is raise taxes instead of lower taxes. Uh, the banks are in trouble, the regulators are squeezing the banks, and uh, that, that's what's going on. It's just very difficult in today's environment to do business and make money. Very simple. Mm -hmm. So having gone through all these different cycles, what are some of the most important things that you have gathered through your 45 years that are important to continue? Cash is king. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it again, cash is king. And we have, since, 90, since 1995, when the, when the economy finally turned around, we decided that we were going to start taking our money and putting it in the bank and not invest it in anything. So we have right now somewhere around $90 million cash in the bank. So we have banks lined up coming in and taking numbers to do business with us. They want to do business with people who don't need to do business with them, so they, the people who have cash. And the other thing we learned in that 91-95 recession, one day we had a, co a company called Nations Bank, we call it Nasty Bank, uh, <laughs> who had taken over Bank of... Uh, was it, it was Merrill National Merrill Bank. National. They had taken over Merrill National. In fact, they gave them... The, Feds gave them Maryland National Bank. And Nasty Bank comes in and says, You're, you have a line of credit for $90 million. And Larry and I are sitting there waiting for them to give us an award because we had paid them $11 million in interest the year before. And we weren't defaulting. We had, everything was fine. We were making money. And they said, we don't want anybody to owe us $90 million. So we're going to call your line of credit. And I was stunned. That's the only thing I could say. Somebody walks in your office and says, 
pay me back $90 million. And, and I almost started to stutter, and I said, when? And they said, well, this was February 1st, why don't you make it $30 million this year? So we did it. We got them back $30 million. Our reward was they asked for another $30 million. That's, the, that's our second lesson. We will never, ever have a line of credit. It is callable at the whim of the bank for any reason they feel to call it, and I will never do it. From now on, every loan we have is a specific loan with terms and years and everything else. And they all beg, beg you to have lines of credit because it takes a lot of overhead off of them and they make more money. Never do it. Never have a line of credit. I want to know when that loan is up, how long it's going to be, and when I need to pay it back. By the way, do you remember the, the third year when they came in and said, we'll give you a discount, significant dis discount to pay off the balance of it. So we had made a phone call to another bank and within a month, we were able to replace that debt. But in that same meeting, after they said they were giving us a discount to pay off the loan, what was, do you remember what the next part of the meeting was after we did that? Yes. What do you got for us now for new business? Yes. <laughs> Honest to God. I mean, you had to, you had to be sitting there to, to see it. It was kind of like, that's done, new business. Now, by the way, Nasty Bank is known as the Bank of America. Bank of, bank of America. America. Bank. I, I conveniently forgot. <laughs> Make sure no. <laughs> okay, so um, Ed, so from 1970 or 1995 to 2008, you put together this war chest of 100 million dollars. This might sound like a silly question, but how did that 100 million dollars? help position the company going into the Great Recession of 2008? Well, again, it's what I said before, Larry. I mean, banks want to do business with us when they don't want to do business with Everybody says no bank wants to do business with them. Banks want to do business with us because we've got all this cash. Uh, it also uh, allowed us to buy things that other people couldn't buy. There have been some very, very good projects, like the million square foot mall in Harrisburg sold for 10 cents on the dollar. We bought it for $9 million from, I think it was TD Bank? Was that yes. Correct? TD Bank, who had put $110 million into it. Uh, we bought the Gateway Building, which is a five-story office building, 100,000 square feet. We bought that for about 12 cents on the dollar. Uh, but you have to have cash. And you, you buy it for cash, and then, and then you redo it, and then you get a mortgage on it. And that's we've been able to do those projects when other people couldn't do it. And, and the biggest project we were able to do uh, was the gate. The gate is inside Aberdeen Proving Grounds. A company, Opus, Opus Development Company, went broke. And uh, to participate or to try to get control of it, you had to put up $2 million. But well, we had $2 million. And it was a matter of writing a check. You put up $2 million, it was a gamble. The gamble worked. And in three years, we developed $150 million worth of product. And we got the contract signed in 10 working days. We had the Pentagon signature on it. Uh, without that money, we couldn't have done that. Other very good firms in, in around Maryland they're just paralyzed because they have to go to banks every time and they don't have money in the bank. Yeah. Maple Lawn? No, Maple example. Lawn was another one, yeah. I can't think of any of that. That one, oh, yes. But, but by the way, going through Maple Lawn after we purchased an interest in that, that project, I'll never forget you and I driving to meet with the bank and Ed looking around, just the excitement of how beautiful is this. So it's just amazing after all these years, the intensity and the love for the business. Um, casinos? Oh, that's right. We bought, we've bought three casinos, uh, two in Nevada and one in Colorado, and we got those for about 10 cents on the dollar. The casinos are fascinating. You, the most recent one we have under contract is probably $200 million worth of real estate. 
and I think that's even a small, it's a, it's a thousand room hotel, just to give you an idea. It's a thousand room hotel, a parking lot. It's on a waterfront. It's, it's amazing. And we're getting it for $9 million. Now, I think they just dropped it five. It's actually $7 million and we're going to put some million. dollars into it. But you've got to put up the $7 million. You can't borrow anything. You've got, you've got to put up the money. It's going to cost another probably 6 or $7 million to, to redo it, get the cash flowing, and then you can get a loan. So that's, that's how it's helping in this environment. Mm -hmm. Which is, what is really nice about this is during the worst recession ever, and we've had such significant success with these projects because of the cash. So it was a great insight on Ed's part. In the business community, you are highly respected for several predictions that you've made. There's many of them, but I'll just highlight a few of them. The, the first one was in uh, October of 2005. You elected, and by the way, residential housing was at its peak. It still hadn't peaked. It peaked in 2006, I think August of or October of 2006. So here we are in 2005, and you short the residential housing index. Can you tell us a little bit about that? All right. Uh, what Larry's referring to is I watched housing for five years go up 15% a year. And at first, it didn't phase me. I mean, you know, houses were going up a lot each year. But then I watched friends of mine buying and selling houses. Now, they're in the commercial real estate business, and they're buying and selling houses, not apartments. Uh, other people I knew were buying apartments at obscene prices and turning them into condos and selling, and they were selling them and making money. And I'm watching residential real estate, which for recorded history had always gone up one to one and a half percent above inflation. It was never an investment, it was a place to live. And, was, and if you retired and sold it and moved into a hotel, I mean into an apartment, you had some money. And all of a sudden, it was now an investment. And we're going into, the, into like four and a half years of this growth of 15% a year. We were 75% above where we started five years before. And I knew it was a bubble that was going to pop. So I called a friend of mine, Jamie Kajowski, and I said, Jamie, what do we do? How can we take this knowledge that we know it's a bubble and it's going to pop and do something? But I don't want to lose any money. I don't want to be in a position where if I put in $5 million, I can lose $20 million. So he and his company, do you remember what company that was? Uh, Mor uh, was it Morgan Stanley? I think it was One Morgan of the Stanley. ones that went It was broke. Morgan Stanley, because I can yeah. picture them. I said, come up with some investment where we can't lose any more than we put in. And he did, and we invested $7.5 million in a three-year program. And three years later, the index had dropped so low that we got back 16. But that was it. Great call. Here's my favorite. It's, uh, it was a nice, sunny, hot August day in 2007. The Dow was at 13,200. I'm getting in 9 o'clock, pouring my coffee, looking at some emails. I think our competitors are probably getting ready to tee off the local <laughs> golf course. So I get a call from Ed. He's Larry. How much money do we have in the stock market? Uh, uh oh. Can you tell us where you were headed with that? And well, the, the number was 40 million, by the way. We had 40 million of our 100 million in the stock market. And on Monday, that was on a Wednesday, right? Yes. I on Monday, I had read, and I, I may have this wrong as to which day and which bank it was. There was a bank in Germany that had filed bankruptcy because of the American uh, that the subprime. subprime mortgages. I had never heard of a subprime mortgage in my whole life. And I went, oh, that's interesting. On Tuesday, a French bank filed bankruptcy because of investment in American subprime mortgages. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. So that day, I looked up, we found out, Larry and I found out, what is a subprime mortgage? 
and we found out things like liar's loans, like people were getting mortgages without any documentation, they were just walking in and getting them. And on Wednesday, another bank in another country in Europe filed bankruptcy because of American subprime mortgages. And I found that out at about 8 o'clock in the morning while I was watching Fox News, or actually it was Fox <coughs> Business News while I was on my treadmill. And right around 9 o'clock when I got finished working out, I called Larry and I said, Larry, it's only a matter of time before it comes across the pond. Get out of the stock market. And we got out, and then we watched the stock market grow up, keep going for six months. And then it went over the edge and dropped from 14,000 to 6,000. <laughs> By the way, when Ed had us call all the brokerage houses, I called, we had three of them. So the instructions were, get out today. All three people said, oh, let's call Ed. Can we have a conference call? We, we said, no, we'll have a conference call Monday. Get out today. Get out today. And then the Dow went up to 14.2, which was its previous high that we just hit recently, or matched recently and exceeded, just to humble us. And, um, and then 18 months later, it was 6,500. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it takes a lot to put your money where your mouth is, and that makes a believer out of a lot of people. So Ed, in your professional career, what has been your greatest success? Greatest success? Uh, it would have to be the Everett Improving Grounds. Mm -hmm. APG, it'd have to be APG. Uh, I mean, that. You, you could write an MBA thesis on what we, how we got that project, how we, how we, I don't know how we did it. I mean, honestly, we have been dealing with the Army since, and dealing with the Army is like dealing with that pole right there. <laughs> really, <laughs> I mean, you know, they have Easter month, Christmas month, <laughs> Valentine's month, I, I, any, holiday you can think of that's usually a day, they take a month off. <laughs> but they wanted this project done, and, and Tino, my staff, was the leader of it, and Jerry Witt was there, and they literally worked. Tina came back, I remember Tina came back from Ocean City, I think, and they worked night and day for 10 working days. And on the 10th day, we got the we got somebody, I forget his name, to go down to the Pentagon, and he got a general to sign the paper, and we were there. It wasn't a perfect contract, but it, it got us in the door. And we started developing buildings and leasing them, and we have 600,000, it's now been about three years, we have 600,000 square feet of space occupied, and all our competition outside the gate since we had that first square footage available, have not leased a thing. You're either in the gate or you're in no, nowhere's land. Mm -hmm. And then what is it, about 150 million in value? 150 in value. We, we built $150 million worth of product in, in less than three years. In the worst recession ever. In the worst, yeah, that's right, the worst recession ever. So this one's going to be a tough one for you, but have you ever made any major mistakes in your life, in your career? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the number one was, I mean, I'll tell you this, the number one made in my whole, if you my personal and business? Whatever. Okay. Business and personal. <laughs> okay. I might learn something new tonight. Huh? No. <laughs> Take some notes. Yeah. There's only one period of time in your life, and had I gone to somebody of, of older and more wisdom, I'm sure he would have said what I'm about to say. Because if somebody came to me with the same question, instead of my th three brat brothers and a six pack of beer, if I had gone to an older person of wisdom, they would have probably said what I'm about to say is you only have one time in your life to fly jets. Go do it. You got the rest of your life to make money, to get into business. I should have done. That's the number one mistake I made. But in business, uh, we have made mistakes. We have gone into projects that 
we go into projects, by the way, to make money. We do not go into projects because they're glamorous, because we're going to get written up. I mean, that happens sometimes. But we go in specifically on the numbers. And when the numbers turn, and if we can get out, we will. And we have walked away from, the biggest one was $5 million. We just said, sorry, it turned, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And we've walked away from a $5 million one, we've walked away, I think, from some threes and a, and a bunch of ones. I mean, to get into a project, have a million dollars invested, just walk. Because it'll take you down. They can take you down. That five million becomes 10, and then it becomes 20, and then it becomes 30. And it, uh, the Merritt organization in the early 90s almost went down because of that. Leroy got involved in a thing called Scarlet Place downtown. And I was sitting with him. And he said, I got $5 million in this thing. I said, Leroy, walk. Leave it. He said, I can't walk from $5 million. I think when he finally left, he finally got out of it. It was like 25 or 30. And it's, that's a big hit. I don't care who you are. So, okay. that's it. What has been the most important key to your success? Hiring those A-plus people. <laughs> I mean, I don't want anybody dumber than me. I want everybody <laughs> smarter than me. Or else, what are they doing there if they're not smarter than me? Who violated that? <laughs> <laughs> For 10 years. It took me 10 years to teach Larry that. He kept saying, well, why should I hire these smart people? What do you need me for? Oh, God. <laughs> finally, finally. Self-preservation. <laughs> but I eventually learned. <laughs> so, so, Ed, I know you have many years left. I'm sure the University of Baltimore will be doing an update in 20 years with you sitting here just to see what you did in the next uh, two decades Your and so forth. Your God's ears. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> But what have you done to secure the future succession of the company? Well, we're looking, we're making sure that everybody, all the senior vice presidents, have people under them who are as good as they are, or maybe better, using our way of looking at things, uh, that can, should they get hit by an automobile tomorrow morning, we're not going to be sitting there going, oh my God, what do we do now? Uh, so. That's what we're doing. We are making sure that every division of the company has succession plan in place, that we know where to go to in case something happens. What are your thoughts on the economy going forward? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you maybe ask a little more specifically? What do you mean? Just uh, interest rates, the oh. debt, national debt, inflation. All right. Interest rates. I think interest rates, personally, I think, is it Benanke who's running the printing presses? Mm -hmm. As long as his printing press doesn't break, interest rates will stay down. Uh, the Obama administration seems to do everything wrong. They're nice people, but they don't know what they're doing economically. And Bernanke keeps the presses running to kind of balance off what they're doing. So interest rates are going to stay down. I think inflation is going to stay down because the economy is not going to grow, you know, in a, in a very hot fashion. It will grow slowly. They're still fighting, by the way, and have been fighting in Japan for 15 years. They're fighting depression. And I just read in the Wall Street Journal two days ago that it's still in effect. Depression, by the way, is when prices of food go down. Prices of houses, we, we can't imagine it because it hasn't hasn't happened here since 1933, but uh, that's still going on in Japan. Uh, so we got interest rates, the economy, what else? Inflation. Inflation. At some point, the debt and the printing presses are going to meet. The printing press is going to break, and when that printing press breaks, inflation is going to explode. And thank God we're in a pretty inflation-proof business as long as there is an economy. I mean, if the economy goes to zero, no business is mm -hmm. inflation proof. This next area is one of my favorites. Um, in 2012, you were voted the Outstanding Philanthropist of the Year for the state of Maryland. Can you tell us when and why giving back became so important to you? Well, it's kind of a 
two-pronged thing. Uh, the first thing that happened, happened to me about the idea of giving uh, for no reason other than giving, you know, the, the joy of giving, was one of my, I was a senior <clears throat> and pretty politically active at the University of Maryland on, you know, campus politics. And one of our freshman pledges wanted to become the freshman president, which if you're a senior, that's pretty easy. So I showed him what to do, and he became the president. He never said thank you. And I felt good about it. I felt good about the fact he became president, but he never said thank you. And I thought, I, I, that was a lesson I learned. Do things to help people, and don't look for people to say thank you, or to praise you, or anything else. Don't do it for that purpose. Do it because it's the right thing to do. And in about 1990, I met a man named Lou Grasmick, and I got to know him pretty well. Lou calls me up one day, and Lou was known for his philanthropy and organizing things for charities, and he calls me up and asks me to raise $25,000. And I said, Lou, how am I going to raise $25,000? I don't know raise I said, I'll give you some money, but I don't know how to raise it. He said, well, come over to my office. I'll teach you how to do it. And he taught me how to do it. He taught me how to raise money for charities. And it's a process. And the people who are in, the, I think it's called the development business, it's a fancy word for raising money. Every nonprofit has a development officer. And uh, they go about a process of how to raise money. So he taught me the process of raising money. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. You can raise money for charities. Uh, and then we started giving money ourselves, we started raising money for charity, and we were raising money for any charity that asked us. And it became very obvious that we had to guide this thing, so we started a trust, a charitable trust. And it had to have a mission, and we decided the mission was going to be education. It was going to be education from pre-K through 12th grade, on the idea that there's a lot of government programs for people who want to go to college, uh, but the people who needed help were the ones under, under 12th grade. So that's what we do. Our, our charities now put quite a bit of money into that. Quite a bit. Um, over the last 12 years, $50 million. <laughs> yeah. Remember that. So. So, Ed, throughout the years, you've won many awards and honors and so forth. To you, which one has been the most important? The honorary doctorate, public service at the University of Maryland. That was unbelievable. I never expected that. And that had to do with the philanthropy and the charity and, and all the things that I've helped, like being chairman of the Science Center and that kind of thing. I like it when you received your award. At, we were saying in our Thursday meetings, and I said, "But what you get? What's your degree?" And he says, "I don't know. It's an honorary DPS, Doctor of Public Service." He goes, "I thought they were going to give me something in business or finance or <laughs> construction." And but this was encompassing, I believe, all the different areas. So it was actually greater. Yeah, so out of all the successes and accomplishments you've had in life, what is the one thing? that you want people to always remember when they hear the name Edward St. John? Uh, it's two things. Number one, my word is my bond. And for the first five years that I was in business, we didn't even have contracts or partnership agreements. We didn't. Uh, Lira and I never had a partnership agreement. We just did things. And when we bought land and had partners, we had no contracts. And when two of our partners got into a big fight and they were suing each other, we got caught up in it because there was no partnership agreements. Everything was done by handshake. And that still is today. I mean, we, we will stand behind anything. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. We've, there have been two occasions in our company where we've had people been with us over 20 years. And they started to become ineffective, and yet they were been effective for over 20 years, and they, I don't know, 
I guess Alzheimer's or whatever, set in, and we kept them on the payroll. They couldn't be in the office, but we kept them on the payroll till they reached 65. I think one of them was 61, I think, if I remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have somebody today that's going through that. Uh, and, and the other thing is, if you invest with us, I will worry about your money more than I worry about mine. Because I don't worry about when I invest. It just doesn't phase me. But if I'm investing your money in a project, I worry about it. And then I think it was 1974, 75, we had a bunch of investors in Friendship Business Center. Yes. And the thing did not work out, and we gave them back their money. And gave them 5% interest. Mm -hmm. So we now, they still, still have small interest, but they had all their money back. Right. We have over 150 partners, and Ed, when someone comes in the front door looking for a new venture, get, he is so proud to give them the list of the 150 partners and their phone numbers to call. To call them all. So, it, my, my favorite is uh, when we make a distribution check to a partner of size. Can you tell everyone what you typically do with it? I, I take them to, you know, if it's over a million dollars, I'll take them to dinner and hand them the check. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one very well-known partner. I'd rather not say his name. We have one very, very well-known partner. Uh, and I always put him at the top of the list because if you call him and he says, when Ed calls me, I ask two questions. How much you want and where do I send it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's all the questions I have, but we would like to open it up to any questions to the audience and so forth. If anyone has any questions, Can yes. Here? Thank you, Mr. St. John, for uh, sharing your insight and history. Um, as a student here at the university, looking forward now, if you were to you have a tremendous experience, all the battles and scars that you've gone through, but looking forward, if you were a new student, new person getting into the real estate industry, where do you see opportunity? What avenues would you pursue? What light do you see in the middle of the cloud that is the current economic condition? Well, in the current economic condition, I mean, we are doing wonderfully well at the gate, inside the gate at Aberdeen Proving Ground. We're doing wonderfully well uh, at Maple Lawn, which is the next interchange south of Columbia on 29. There's a big demand for well-done mixed-use projects. Um, and it's just so difficult to get these started. Um, but it depends. I mean, I think today you'd have to go with a, a company and either stay with that company and, and become one of the leaders of that company or start off you know, in a small way your, yourself with the development. I, mean, I know quite a few guys, that, believe it or not, in this business who have the potential to be big, but they don't want to take the, the financial risk. I know quite a few guys that, you know, they'll buy a small warehouse, they'll buy a small shopping center, they'll lease it, and, but, and then keep buy another small one, and another small one. And you keep buying small ones, you don't grow, you don't get big. At some point, you've got to start buy big, buy big ones or build big ones. But uh, that's what I would do. I would go work for a company that's successful and learn how to do it and either stay with that company most of the people that come with us stay with us because they become part of the company. You know? and we give small percentages of the company to the people. And uh, what do we have now, 130 employees? We have 140 employees and, and 50 employees have been with us over 10 years. And again, we started, we had 12 employees when I started in 1982. So. It says a lot. Hey, look. Hey. Um, how do you go about finding A-plus talent? Do you recruit for it, or do they, they search you out with um, learning more about your business and 
and try to make connections in which to be hired by your company? How do we find A-plus talent? By interviewing a lot of people. And we have a, we have a uh, test we use. It's not a test. It's a personality evaluation. And it's called the ABA. And it costs us quite a bit of money. Um, I know it cost us $30,000 to start with. I don't, what does it cost now per year? Like $10,000 $10, <laughs> $10, per year. 10000 a year. And this very simple questionnaire has the ability to tell us what a person's uh, not talent, but what they are. If you work with somebody for a year, you'd say, I know that person pretty well, if you work side by side with them. This evaluation can let us know if a person's got the potential to do the job in 10 minutes. And it, it, it's 95% accurate. It, it's never let us down, never ever let us down. Um, I just have one question about what work that I, um, I think uh, really part of the business. That's what the instinct. So what is your perspective in that word instinct? And have you ever used that, um, you know, as, that word in making decision? Instinct. Yes, when I did the seven votes against the six votes, <laughs> that was instinct. <laughs> I used my calculator. That was my downfall. <laughs> I mean, it just, to me, it was such a, a, a fantastically well-located piece of land, and I wasn't going to let the fact we had a failure in one little project affect it. I mean, that was instinct. I mean, there's nothing else but instinct. I saw so there are a lot of uh, other developers out there in this area. Who, who do you admire? I'm not going to ask you to say who, who, who you show, but who do you admire? Who else has done things that you look up to that you get your inspiration from or you think are worth emulating as well? You know, somebody once asked me who our competition is, and my answer was, we are the competition. We don't have any competition. I oh, truly I don't admire West. anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are, we are the competition. We're the thousand pound gorilla. Um, Ed, it's Brooks. I just want to tell you how pleased I am to be here. And um, I'm not in the real estate business. But um, as I've told you a number of times, I, I'm incredibly proud of you as a <coughs> businessman how successful you have been in doing it in a really quality way with tremendous integrity. That was my comment. Uh, now, I'm sitting here thinking if I were one of the students and I were soaking in all this information, can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, you made a comment earlier about cash is king, which I think everybody knows that and you went through those times where it was really, really important. You also commented about staying away from debt, or at least having the cash get into the deals. So I was thinking about that. If I were getting ready to start my career in real estate, it's great to hear that from you because you've had this tremendous amount of success, so you have a lot of cash. But what would you say to the younger people starting out where inevitably, pretty much so, unless you disagree with my thought, they, they really kind of have to leverage themselves Again, I would assume you agree with that. Yeah, I think you misunderstood. And if you misunderstood, because you know us pretty well, then many people here misunderstood. I didn't say stay away from debt. Uh, of the $2 billion worth of assets, we probably have a billion two in debt. I said stay away from letters of uh, lines, lines of credit. Lines of credit are neutron bombs. They destroy the developer and leave the building. It's just, you know, it's, they're just horrible forms of credit. And they were never made for the development business. They were made for the manufacturing business to take some of the highs and lows out. Uh, and they're callable. A loan 
that's got an interest rate and number of years and you know the, the standard business loan we have lots of those like i said we have a probably a billion two it's over a billion, billion three yeah. mm -hmm. of loans so we're not opposed to debt we live on debt uh it's it's so yes when you start off on your own you have to you have to hock your firstborn your own <laughs> <laughs> everything else if you come into our office i'll show you the first mortgage I signed on that building that I said was so beautiful and it turned out to be six little garages, but I have that mortgage. The original of that mortgage is hanging on the wall, signed by Leroy, his wife, my wife, and myself. And somewhere on there, I think my kids signed. <laughs> <laughs> by, by the way, it was 7%. It's, 7%. Uh, yeah. we're, we're doing a little cheaper today. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mr. St. John. Thank you for sharing your stories. I'm Randall Conus, and uh, truly respect you as a legend. My question to you is, what is your typical daily routine? What's my typical daily routine? I get up at 6 o'clock, and I work out till 8 o'clock. Uh, I usually get in the office somewhere between 9 and 10. And uh, I don't know. I got about 20 things. <laughs> They're like very important to get done, and I try to get some of them done, and 20 more things get in their way. And I am, I am at the end of the day usually with more things to do than I started with, and I, I usually leave somewhere 5 36, somewhere in that range. That's a typical work day for me, except on Thursdays that start at, we start at 8 o'clock in the morning with engineering meetings, and we go through with meetings with all our partners until 3 o'clock, including our partners in the casinos. See, I don't have to take care of the day-to-day -day business anymore. Larry does that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Well, Ed, I'd like to thank you very much. And, and you know, tonight I've heard and lived many of these stories with you. But every time I hear you talk, I learn something new. And um, you know, I want to personally thank you for allowing me to be a part of your great organization. Well, thank you for being there. <laughs> well, clearly, you need to write a book. <laughs> Um, Memoirs. Memoirs. And I think it would be a, a bestseller uh, in the real estate programs. Uh, it would be a bestseller for MBA students. Um, and it reinforces um, a lot of what we try to teach and how effectively we sometimes make those connections. Um, we talk about the importance of integrity. Um, we've actually talked about the shifting priorities between um, balance sheets, financial statements, the cash is king. I think we've all learned that lesson over the past five, six years. Um, it was interesting, the question about um, instinct, intuition, insights. I think that when you look at success, you need intelligence, and I don't think there's anyone in this room who would doubt the remarkable intelligence of Ed St. John. But you also have, that, have to have that keen ability to identify opportunities when no one else does and to trust your judgment. And some of that comes over time, um, but some of it is instinctual. And I think that uh, a lot of the leadership books talks about the importance of trusting instinct. And when you don't, you lose your effectiveness as a leader. And, um, and you can talk about per perseverance and tenacity, and you can go on and on with the lessons uh, that we learned tonight. Um, I, I know I was sitting in the front row absolutely um, captured uh, by your words, and uh, I'm so glad we're having it. We had it videotaped uh, because I think it's a, a video that we will use over and over again. And so with much appreciation, we have a token and of our appreciation. 
Are you doing okay? Yeah. Hop along? Don't tell my doctor, but I'll hobble over. How old did you say you were? <laughs> <laughs> I was two years old when Larry started to say jump out. <laughs> Why he's hopping, and I, well, as soon as I found out what he did, I said, "Have you forgotten your age?" <laughs> Ask my wife what happened. She reminds me often. But Ed, Larry, uh, thank you again on, on behalf of uh, the University of Baltimore and the Real Estate and Economic Development Advisory Board. I want to present you with a with a small gift, Ed. Thank you. Board uh, and a certificate of appreciation for being our legend in real estate. So thank you very much. Can I say one thing? Absolutely. Somebody asked the question, how do you find the best? Who was that? Okay. Right over there is Lacey. And Lacey's working. Lacey, stand up, please. Late, I went to dinner with Lacey and Christian. And Lacey was lamenting the fact that the company she was working for, every time she broke their sales ceiling and was, if I remember correctly, she was on a commission basis and they set it up so she'd make $200,000. And every time she went to 250, it would cut her territory. And they had done it three years in a row. And I looked at her and said, do you want to come with us? <laughs> we don't cut people's territory. The more money she makes, the more money we make. And that's how I look at it. There's how we find the best. You just keep your eyes open, you listen, and, and you do find the best. And just all the people that are here tonight, that's how we found them. Thanks.